Ted Ruger, the Dean of uh, University of Pennsylvania's Cary Law School, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to, to tonight's event on this uh, most important topic. Uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, almost a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, we saw a disturbing rise in violence and bias and hate directed at uh, Asians and Asian Americans in this country as hateful rhetoric and, and shameful actions uh, connected with the global pandemic and the rhetoric and action of some of our leaders in this country um, to, um, to target and, uh, and bring bias and violence against uh, Asian Americans. Sadly, even one year into this pandemic, uh, there's been of late a, a, another troubling upsurge in violence against Asian Americans and Asians in this country. We know that these incidents of bias and hatred have touched um, some in our own community, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, uh, as they have people across the country. And uh, on behalf of the law school, we stand in solidarity uh, with you in repudiation of this bias and harm, and we want to continue to work with you um, and against this, uh, this kind of uh, hatred um, and seek to advocate for, for justice and equality through um, supporting you and, and supporting the rule of law uh, uh, against this kind of behavior. Um, we are so honored and grateful on, on, uh, to have on short notice uh, an, an eminent uh, legal advocate uh, joining us from uh, the other coast, uh, Cecilia Wong, who's the National ACLU's Deputy Legal Director and the Director of the ACLU Center for Democracy, who has worked on issues of um, injustice and, and discrimination for, for decades um, at the ACLU and elsewhere. Um, our Asian Pacific Law Students Association, APALSA, uh, leaders will offer a, a more full introduction for Ms. Wong. Um, I can say I, I enjoyed uh, uh, meeting her many years ago, uh, following on uh, kind of overlapping briefly in a, a clerkship setting. And uh, among other like amazing things uh, Cecilia Wong did back then, she uh, in the legal work for Justice Blackman and Justice Breyer, um, she also uh, helped research and, and serve on the set of the movie Amistad about a different kind of fight for freedom and against racism. And so that was something that's not part of the typical bio or the typical clerkship that uh, was, uh, was a notable uh, part of, of, of her history. Um, um, Cecilia, thank you so much for being here. And, and I really am grateful for you coming back to Penn Law School. You were here as our uh, honorary fellow for Public Interest Week a, a few years ago. Um, our PULSA group, along with other student co-signers, sent a strong message uh, condemning anti-Asian hatred and violence uh, last week. I thank them and, and thank you and support you, uh, all of our students and student leaders, for your leadership uh, and want to take uh, an opportunity to say that as dean as, and as the, the dean of this law school, I share your outrage. I share uh, the desire to work with you on pushing back and supporting you and, and others against this kind of uh, unacceptable bias and hatred. So it's my pleasure to introduce Apalsa co-president our student, Jennifer Kim, who will formally uh, introduce uh, Cecilia Wong. Thank you. I don't think I could beat the movie fact for my introduction, but I will try. <laughs> we are so honored to have Ms. Cecilia Wong with us today. Ms. Wong is a deputy legal director at the National ACLU. She directs the Center for Democracy, as we just heard. And the Center of Democracy really encompasses so many of the critical and fragile issues of our time, including immigrants' rights, voting rights, national security, human rights, and speech, privacy, and technology. She is also a past director of the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project. Cecilia's work as a trial and appellate lawyer in civil rights, as well as criminal defense is incredible. And just to touch on a couple examples, um, Cecilia brought a challenge before the Supreme Court, arguing against the government's harsh interpretation of an immigrant detention law requiring without any hearing, the jailing of immigrants defending against deportation charges based on prior criminal history, even when the criminal sentences had already been served. And she also made a winning argument before the Fourth Circuit in an establishment clause challenge to pass President Trump's proclamation barring the entry of visitors and immigrants from predominantly Muslim countries. And when I look at her work, it really showcases for me both the difficulties as well as the hope of utilizing the law as a voice for justice. And it's also really quite a timely indicator of how discrimination and prejudice both, I think, generally, 
as well as in the specific case of anti-Asian racism, is not a new phenomenon. It's historically rooted. And therefore, that's something that we as a community can very much examine and learn from as we go forward. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Cecilia Wong, for all of your amazing legal work, and also for taking the time to come and speak with us about the latest iteration of anti-Asian discrimination and hate. And I'll also take a moment here to announce the first CLE password for people who are seeking CLE credit. Um, I have been informed that there is a link in the chat to sign up for CLE credit if you have not yet done so. And I'll announce the first password. It's anti-racism. Just to announce that one more time, it is anti-racism. It should also be popping up in the poll feature on Zoom. And with that, I will pass it off to our amazing student moderators, Maya Reddy and Caitlin Catalano. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Cecilia, for joining us tonight to discuss the recent escalation of anti-Asian racism in this country, though definitely not a new phenomena. And I thought that, you know, it was very fitting for me to wear my Sandra O oh shirt in which she said, it's just an honor to be Asian um, at the Emmys a few years ago. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is such an important conversation and Caitlin, Jennifer, and I, and many of the other Asian students um, have talked a lot about how, you know, there aren't all often spaces to discuss discrimination targeting Asian Americans. Um, and so to be able to have a space to do that with someone like you, um, who has done so much incredible work within the legal sphere, uh, and also sponsored by, um, you know, the law school itself uh, is really impactful on kind of that visibility front of being Asian Americans. Um, but we're really excited to get into this conversation and, you know, off the bat, anti-Asian crimes have risen about 150% in major cities recently, ranging from violence against elderly folks to violence against younger Asian Americans experiencing mental health crises. And this shows both a troubling rise in racially motivated crime, as well as to a certain extent, the limits of the current structures in place to combat such crime. So we're really excited to dig, the, dig into this with you today, if I can't say excited enough. Um, and I thought that, you know, as we get into this, it, it could be helpful to contextualize the conversation with defining Asian American and, and looking at some of the history of similar anti-Asian violence in this country, since oftentimes, you know, even when we see the acronym AAPI, uh, it, it's very much linked to a monolithic understanding of Asian Americans. Um, and so I was curious kind of in the work that you have done and, and how um, you, you know, you went to law school at a different time than we are going to law school and certainly how Asian Americans identify as like a political entity, as a community itself um, has changed during that time. So was curious kind of how you have inter interacted with this definition that seems to be changing constantly. It's a great question, Maya. <clears throat> and thank you to you and Caitlin and Jennifer and Dean Ruger for the warm welcome. I always love to um, visit Penn Law, including by Zoom these days. Um, you know, I think that you really went to the heart of one of the factors that makes the discussion about anti-Asian bias attacks and anti-Asian racism more generally such a complicated one. Um, and that's that this, um, you know, idea of Asian Americans or API community is, <clears throat> you know, at heart a political construct. It is um, like the term Hispanic or the idea Hispanic, something that was created, um, you know, for, for various um, US government purposes. And in fact, um, the community is held together, the Asian American Pacific Islander community is held together by certain shared experiences, um, including experiences of racism. Um, but at the same time, we're enormously diverse. There's linguistic diversity. There's diversity in um, immigration experience um, when the bulk of um, different um, subsets of API communities um, tended to immigrate um, and huge variations in um, socioeconomic um, circumstances for different parts of our community. And understanding that history um, is really at the heart of how we 
um, together um, are going to um, address and uh, rise above moments like this. So one thing that um, I've thought about a lot um, in thinking about um, API, anti-Asian anti um, bias attacks is, you know, our communities are, can be so fragmented um, because um, it's, and it's also, it's geographically fragmented. It's um, fragmented along generational lines, generation from immigration. Um, and for all the other reasons I already said. And so it's hard, um, particularly hard for Asian Americans to come together um, in solidarity at moments like this um, within Asian American communities, as well as across um, other communities of color um, and in progressive movement, anti-racism um, movements. Um, and so I think that that's one of our central challenges. Um, and you know, when I think about, I think about this, the, the rise in anti-Asian crimes, um, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, APIs who have psychiatric disabilities often related to an experience of trauma um, in, a, in the home country um, for people who are refugees and communities that have a lot of refugees in particular and police responses um, with excessive force used against um, people from API communities. These are all things that aren't talked about um, often enough. And so when we come into this period starting in March a year ago in 2020, where we see this, this rise in anti-Asian um, violence, anti-Asian racism, um, you know, many of us have been personally affected or have had family members affected. Um, for me, it's part of the fabric of thinking about um, the killing of George Floyd, um, of thinking about so much other um, uh, racism that really cold um, in, a, in, in unusually vocal ways during um, the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, and I think about the trauma that Asian American communities suffered under the um, presidency of Don Donald Trump um, in terms of immigration policy, um, in terms of his expressions of support for white supremacists, um, starting with the Charlottesville um, March, tragically. And, um, you know, what that means across immigrant communities, um, whether Asian or Black or Latinx, um, as, as we confront um, that, that racist vitriol kind of percolating and replicating and, and escalating um, through the communities where we live as Asian Americans. It's really kind of interesting thinking about and important thinking about solidarity both within the Asian communities and with other marginalized communities, because it feels like, I mean, this is, I can only speak to my own family's experience, but it, it feels like a lot of immigrants, uh, when they are recent to this country, there is this kind of self-protective nature of like, you know, we are, uh, we're not going to kind of cause a fuss, we're going to stay silent, we're going to do whatever we can do to protect ourselves. And often, you know, I, I've seen that as kind of um, or I've experienced it being kind of a wedge in between solidarities with other Asian communities. Um, like I know, I mean, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, but in my, there are some folks within my family were South Asian from India. We'll say sometimes not the most, you know, politically correct kind of ways to refer to uh, East Asian communities um, and other Asian communities, despite, you know, there being a wealth of shared experiences. And I find that to be also really interesting because I haven't often encountered, like you were saying, this awareness of what are the traumas that these Im immigrant communities are coming into this country with? Like, what is the pressure to kind of like assimilate, to belong so that there isn't, you know, something like uh, yeah, the internment camps after Korematsu or, you know, hundreds of other examples of kind of you know, targeted uh, exclusion in that way. Um, and I, I don't know if you've had thought any about how we kind of include that in our conversations. Yeah, I, I have, I've thought about that a lot and I've um, 
you know, had a lot of conversations with members of my own family about some of the dynamics. Look, immigration is such, um, it's a filter, right? That, um, that, that, that causes a lot of dynamics in Asian American communities and the ways that Asian American communities um, are in solidarity or not with other um, people of color or with um, progressive movements. And it's a filter in two ways. The first way in which it's a filter is um, the US government historically um, and now um, gets to decide who is Asian American because US immigration laws um, are designating who is, is able to come to the United States. And so if you're looking at that first generation American, um, uh, first generation Americans, um, you know, why does the model minority myth exist, right? Why do people think Asians are good at math? Um, I remember when, so, the little side note, tangent, uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has an essay in one of his books, I think it's Outliers, um, where he talks about his theory of why Asians are good at math is that the words for numbers in East Asian uh, um, languages are only one syllable. And so Asians can think more quickly about mathematical concepts. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if Malcolm Gladwell's other essays make any sense, but I know that one doesn't make sense. <laughs> US immigration law, um, when it was loosened up and when anti-Asian um, quotas were finally lifted in um, the 50s and 60s, and finally with the Immigration Act of 1965, um, they were lifted in a way that gave preference to people who were immigrating uh, to, to be in technical fields. They were, they were filtering in people who had um, graduate degrees, who were engineers and doctors. And so the immigration laws by preferring people with those backgrounds and with those particular skills, um, that is one factor that could lead to the model minority myth. Asians are good at math, um, in the U.S., <laughs> um, and in part, you know, not every not every Asian American is good at math, but a lot of Asian Americans are pe perceived to be good at math because that's who uh, the U.S. government let into the country. Immigration is also a filter in that um, people who are going to drop everything and leave everyone behind and move to another country where they don't speak the language. Um, well, or maybe at all, and have to start completely over again, right? Often with occupational downgrading, where you see um, immigrants from any part of the world who, um, you know, arrive in the U.S. and have to start over again. You see um, people who were physicians um, or other professionals in the old country coming to the U.S. and starting over as cab drivers or as nurses. Um, that happens all the time. And so a dynamic you were talking about, Maya, I think is a really important one. I know that um, for many of our parents, if you're second generation like I am, um, you know, there's um, a couple factors. You wanna put your head down and you came to this country to make a better future for your family. And so that's your focus. Um, and the other factor is that, you know, I've, I, growing up as an Asian American and I grew up in the San Francisco suburbs, um, where at a time when there was starting to be um, a, a really large growth in the Asian American population here at that time when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange thing to be a person of color in the U.S. and have parents who grew up in a majority, whatever, Chinese, in my case, um, a country. The, the ways that first generation Americans who are immigrants um, relate to racism, if they're coming from a country that is um, ethnically homogeneous or racially homogeneous is a huge factor. And we could spend days just talking about that, but we won't. So I think you really, um, again, hit the nail on the head, Maya, with identifying some of these factors that have been um, kind of practical barriers to doing solidarity work. Our parents are unlikely, first-generation immigrants um, by and large are gonna be unlikely to have the time or the inclination to, to go to a protest, for example. They're busy working.
think it's really important to highlight um, the unique situation in which the conversation about immigration plays um, in situating the Asian communities within the spectrum of different ethnic communities that exist in this country. Um, and so thinking about sort of the model minority myth and the idea of Asians as perpetual foreigners, um, how do you think that that's a um, kind of part of this monolithic view of Asians and how does that play a role in discrimination and um, sort of the erasure of the hatred and, and discrimination that Asians experience um, throughout history? Uh, in relation to kind of everything else going on. Yeah, I do think there's something unique about anti-Asian racism um, in that, you know, we're, we're as you said, Caitlin, um, perpetual foreigners. You know, when I, when we first started to see the COVID outbreak um, in the U.S. and we initially started hearing reports about um, anti-Asian attacks on the streets uh, by private individuals, um, but also as we saw the Trump administration starting to take, um, you know, institute immigration policy changes as a result of the COVID pandemic, um, I started just taking a look uh, to see, you know, what's the history of, um, you know, U.S. policy in times of pandemic as it relates to immigrants. And you see, um, you know, throughout history that recent waves of um, immigration from certain parts of the world, um, if they coincide with a pandemic, um, the foreigners, the immigrants will be blamed, right? And so with the flu pandemic in 1918, um, you saw Jewish immigrants and refugees being blamed, um, you know, when there was a, an outbreak of bubonic plague in California in the late 1800s and, um, you know, I went back and looked at some articles showing that um, to the Chinese were blamed, even though in fact it wasn't the case that Chinese immigrants um, were the ones spreading bubonic plague. They were blamed in the press and in you know the public eye um, to such a horrific extent that um, there were police officers in um, San Francisco's Chinatown literally grabbing Chinese people on the streets and forcibly um, medicating or vaccinating them. And, um, you know, there's something about our status that is, of course, related to race, where uh, even if you're Irish American, and you might have been blamed, or if you're Jewish American, uh, American Jewish and Jew, and you were blamed for your community was blamed um, at the turn of the last century, um, you know, that doesn't stick with those communities by and large. Um, not that anti-Semitism isn't still an enormous problem in this country, as we saw coming to the surface um, during the Trump administration, um, but there are just ways in which we're still seen as foreigners. And, you know, part of that is just, is, is real, right? There, there are ties between um, Asian Americans and our family members um, and communities in, um, in, in, in Asia. And so the truth is, you know, there, there were people, not necessarily Asian in ethnicity, but people traveling back and forth between um, China in the early days of the pandemic and the United States, um, you know, contributed to the um, arrival of COVID in the United States, probably, you know, the epidemiologists will tell us that. Um, but there's something about being Asian American and that something is racism that leads to anyone who looks Asian being blamed. And as we see from the news reports these days, um, everything you know from these fatal um, assaults on Asian Americans in New York City and San Francisco um, and elsewhere, but also, you know, I just saw the headline in the San Francisco Chronicle today that um, you know, job applicants are being asked, are you Chinese? Um, you know, something you don't, it's pretty, sh uh, Maybe it shouldn't be shocking, but it's pretty horrifying to see happening in this day and age. Right, and I think that something that's really interesting too is the way that Asianness is also at times leveraged by white communities to advance um, white privileging structures um, and to advance sort of the dominance of whiteness 
um, within the power schemes that are, are set up in our society. Um, so some of the, the things that we were discussing um, related to that are the affirmative action pieces um, that we see being brought uh, into really with schools like Harvard um, and how the Asian community is situated as othered from whiteness, but also othered from the solidarity of other people of color um, and what impact that might play on how Asians are viewed as embedded within the framework of this country or, or part of the fabric of, of society here, um, but also how this sort of tension between um, how we define whiteness has played out in history to suit the uh, like agenda of whatever group wants to be using it. Right, and I think you know it's it's a really complicated um, dynamic because as we've alluded to already, there are um, some in our Asian American communities who um, you know are. Um, not aligned in a way that they're actually, you know, kind of adversarial towards, um, you know, cross cross movement um, coalition and and solidarity movements. And I think the affirmative action cases and the ways that um, Asian Americans have really been kind of, um, you know, used uh, in a way by by folks who are behind the, the lawsuits challenging Harvard undergrad admissions, for example are really unfortunate, um, not just in the obvious way, also in ways that affect um, our community's um, long ability to be in solidarity. And about, I, I think it's always by your, I think that, you know, the role is so key. Um, I think about uh, in here in the Bay Area, um, there was a, um, a man in his 80s who had recently immigrated from Thailand to join his adult daughter here, um, Mr. Um, Ratanapakti. And um, the person, he was uh, um, assaulted on the street early in the morning while he was taking his walk and shoved and he fell and died a couple days later. And the man who assaulted him happens to be black. And there have been, you know, incidents over the years in San Francisco where there are tensions between the Black and Asian communities. And what has really been um, so key and I'm, something I'm so grateful for as a San Franciscan, um, as a res resident of the city, is that there are local organizers and local community organizations that really went into rapid response and organized um, Black Asian solidarity events so that there was um, a really well attended rally in Oakland, a Black Asian unity rally against anti-Asian violence. So there are people and we as Asian Americans um, can do things about that dynamic. Those of us who um, do want to stand in solidarity and um, want to do pro-civil rights work um, you know, can reach out and we can through our own activism or our own lawyering um, and, you know, other ways um, in our conversations with our parents um, or other relatives, we can do things to make that solidarity happen. Um, and I think looking to the local example is really inspiring. Um, and I also recognize, you know, that it's people who are, you know, because Asian Americans are such a small minority um, on the national level, you know, in a city like San Francisco where Chinese Americans are, um, you know, a large part of the population and therefore have political power, it's far easier for us to organize than in a place where Asian Americans are a very small minority. And so I think there, are, it's necessary for those of us who are in national organizations to think about how we can, um, uh, do that work, um, you know, across the country and reach out to Asian American communities that, that feel isolated and unsafe. I think this, um, the idea of race or like Asian Americans as kind of like a racial identity is really interesting as well and kind of factors into, you know, we often hear conversations about 
white adjacency in Asian communities, um, and then as well as a perpetual foreigner. And just, I mean, I know we were talking a bit about the affirmative action cases, which are more recent, but I was going to take us back a little bit in time uh, to 1896 uh, for Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, and in the dissent for Plessy v. Ferguson, um, Justice Harlan, in saying that separate but equal is in fact not equal, also had this quote, um, there is a race so different from our own that we do not permit those belonging to it to become citizens of the United States. Persons belonging to it are, with few exceptions, absolutely excluded from our country. I allude to the Chinese race. And so for me, like when I read this in con law, like my 1L con law class, I was losing my mind because I was like, oh, okay. So like there's kind of this baked in legal, almost doctrinal understanding of Asian American identity that is putting us in opposition to Americanness itself. And I wonder how also how not in just terms of community solidarity, but within kind of understandings of um, legal protections for hate crimes um, and, and other racially motivated instances, how this kind of forms a wedge against that and kind of allows, you know, something like the affirmative action cases to hold a little bit more ground because you're already seeing this since the 1800s, this understanding of Asian Americans as other or the perpetual foreigner. Right. Well, I think there's an analysis where the anti-Asian racism is, you know, the, the central, um, the central you know, is, is slavery, right, and anti-Black racism. But, um, you can look at uh, what you said, what you said about white adjacency. Um, as you know, degrees of separation from um, from you know the, the the racial hierarchy is kind of baked into um, constitutional history, right? In that in that same way, um, you know, one of the first laws by the United States Congress was the Naturalization Act of 1790, which limited citizenship or naturalization to free white persons. Um, and, you know, whenever the last time there was a, a big debate over birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment, um, as, uh, you know, anti-immigrant anti activists were trying in, in Congress and outside of Congress were trying to um, reread or, or rewrite the 14th Amendment's birthright citizenship clause, you know, you, you go back at like Professor Garrett Epps, um, you know, who's one of the noted historians of the 14th Amendment, made it clear that in fact, Congress um, in looking at the, in framing the 14th Amendment was really thinking not just about uh, formerly enslaved people, they were thinking about immigrants and specifically about um, Asian immigrants and the idea of birthright citizenship, the idea of, um, of, of you know, it's, that's kind of one of the great American innovations of birthright citizenship um, was not just about um, making sure that formerly enslaved persons would be full citizens of the United States. Um, and we know that because, you know, interestingly in the history, you know, there are all these, um, the, the, the opponents of the 14th Amendment were saying, you're saying that you know, if someone's Chinese, um, you know, and they come over here and have have a baby, that person's going to be a U.S. citizen. So it was debated um, over. I think they mentioned Chinese, they mentioned gypsies for some reason, um, and you know, and so that 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 also the uh, you know the the kind of low points in our constitutional history when it comes to. Um, Asian Americans are also matched by our presence, our presence as Asian Americans in the moments of progress as well. Do you think that it's made it instances like that? And then also there are two cases that Dean Ruger knows that I'm intimately <laughs> obsessed with, um, but Ozawa and Thind, which are, were also two cases centering um, Asian Americans. Ozawa was a, a Japanese, a man of Japanese descent, and Thind uh, was a man of Indian origin. And they were both kind of 
fighting, you know, to become naturalized citizens. Um, and in both of those cases in Ozawa, um, Ozawa argued that his skin color is white and therefore he is white. Um, and the, the Supreme Court was like, no, you're from the Asiatic re region, so there's no way you could be white. And then in Thind, um, uh, Bhagat Singh Thind said he was arguing that because Indians are descendant of the Aryan race, we are white. And then the Supreme Court, and this was only three months after um, Ozawa or so, the Supreme Court was like, no, your skin color is not white. You don't <laughs> look white. So that does not qualify. And I don't, I, I think, you know, I only bring that up because, well, one, it, it is a bit infuriating to look at that history, but also um, it is interesting in thinking about kind of our community's political presence, like how we exist as citizens in the United States, how we're able to kind of create this you know, like we are a community to be targeting, like, leg you know, be concerned about during legislation. And, and we only have a very few amount of um, uh, Congress people of Asian descent uh, to give our communities voices. And so I, I, I'm curious as to how you, how do we navigate that process? Like, how do we hold those two things in tension or it, kind of together that are seemingly intention. Yeah, I was actually earlier, I was going to bring up thin too. It's, a, those are fascinating cases. Um, you know, I think when I think about um, kind of US law over time, I, and, and, and specifically about where we as Asian Americans situate ourselves in that history, um, I think a lot about um, how Chinese immigrants really shaped um, the course of immigration law in the late um, 19th century and early 20th century by hiring lawyers and filing habeas petitions um, when they were uh, being detained um, at Angel Island, the Ellis Island of the West Coast. Um, and, you know, there's the story um, in this, in Lucy Salyer's book, um, Laws Harsh as Tigers, all about how Asian Americans, um, you know, really, you know, use what power they had um, through, um, you know, community organizations through the Tongs at that time um, in Cantonese communities on the West Coast. Um, they used the power that they had through having money um, in order to hire lawyers and, and, and to, to, to assert um, Asian American Chinese communities in the courts. I think about, um, you know, the fact that Japanese Americans, I, I was personally inspired to go to law school by the Japanese American reparations movement and the fact that Japanese American um, second generation uh, lawyers, Nisei lawyers um, decided to go and it's like tilting at windmills, like what a crazy idea in 1982 or whenever they started in the 80s to say, we wanna go and overturn Fred Korematsu's you know, World War II era conviction for violating the internment. Um, you know, when, when Fred had lost his case in one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in Supreme Court history, right? We want to go and, and, and overturn his conviction. And they did it. They did it through creative lawyering um, and through organizing in the community. And so, you know, for every Thind and uh, Ozawa who, who were just trying to do what they could to get the outcome they needed um, as a human being. There are these moments where, um, you know, our communities are standing up in solidarity, and you know, there are missed opportunities too. Um, there are missed opportunities all the time. I like to talk about the fact that the reason I'm an American and the reason I'm even here talking as a lawyer um, is because of the Black Civil Rights Movement. Um, the Immigration Act of 1965, which I mentioned earlier, um, was civil rights era legislation. It followed after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 um, and was made possible, um, was made, you know, it was something that could only be dreamed about, much less enacted into law um, because Black freedom fighters um, you know, marched on Selma. Um, and that's what led to, um, you know, that, that march and many, many others where 
um, you know, black and white Americans um, shed blood in order to win freedom. Um, that's what made it possible for me to be an American because that's what po made it possible for my parents to immigrate in the late 60s. So, you know, I just, it's kind of a rambling answer to your question, but I think, you know, it's, people are going to have different opinions for, you know, all the plaint Asian American plaintiffs in the suit against Harvard <laughs> over undergrad admissions. There are, uh, there's us, there are those of us who are um, fighting for civil rights in solidarity with others um, in, in our country. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think I've been thinking about that a lot as well with the kind of impact that the civil rights movement had on immigration because similarly, my parents wouldn't be here without that. And to kind of hold that and recognize the, I feel like is immensely important in terms of solidarity work and, and understanding kind of how our communities can continue to push forth in um, civil rights causes that directly affect us and other marginalized communities. Um, I just noticed that somebody asked in the chat um, what to define white adjacency. Uh, Cecilia, I don't know if you would like to take a stab at that. Um, yeah, I think where Caitlin should go ahead. All right. Um, so white adjacency is essentially this idea, and of course this is not a dictionary definition, but it's this idea of a non-white group um, kind of mirroring or trying to get as close to whiteness as possible. Um, and so in terms of the, it's often used when we think about the model minority in the Asian American context um, because of the perceived success uh, socioeconomically that um, Asians have. Although that being said, it's a very small minority and does not expand across the um, very many different Asian identities that are in this country. Um, and it often is kind of used as this placeholder of assimilation um, and is used as a way to criticize uh, some folks who may be adhering more so to white adjacency than um, you know, interacting more so with um, Asian communities or other communities of color. It's a very you know, kind of fraught term and a fraught thing to kind of investigate. Um, um, but that is more or less what it means. Um, and then in terms of citations for both Ozawa and Thind, I will drop those in the chat um, as we continue speaking. Um, but uh, Caitlin wanted to kind of pivot us over to kind of talking about how this, is, how all of this connects to now, you know, like the past year and, and how we're seeing these things rise up once again in response to COVID. Um, thank you, Maya, and, and thank you, Cecilia. We've been talking a little bit about the, the shift in rhetoric that has sort of been used on a national level um, during the Trump presidency. Um, but, and, and we've talked about a lot of different ways that anti-Asian sentiment has um, existed throughout our history. Um, something that it's also important to note is that violence against Asians in particular doesn't always manifest as obvious violence, but lately it has. and and. In the chat, um, there's a question that says, uh, why do you think the recent surge in attacks on Asian Americans has generated so little widespread outage um, in the media and in popular discussion? There are no mass protests, no big marches, no outpouring of support on social media. I think that's an important thing um, for us to discuss. And I think it's also important for us to highlight the gender disparity that exists within um, these attacks. Uh, data from the Asian Pacific Policy Planning Council shows that two thirds of victims are female. Um, why are Asian and Asian American women in particular targets? And um, how does this gender disparity play a role in our kind of understanding of uh, the, the broader themes uh, or the broader motivators driving these crimes? Yeah, I, I don't know, frankly, what the answer is to the, to the gender disparity, um, you know, except to, to speculate that you know, there's an there's an intersection of racism and sexism for Asian American women that, um, you know, I think really um, deepens our vulnerability. Um, you know, when it comes to um, you know bias attacks, and I think, you know, I I just don't know. Um, so I'm I'm open to hearing from anyone on the panel or in the audience who who wants to weigh in on that. And I think in terms of, you know, the lack of public outcry, 
I see public outcry actually, uh, you know, I, I, and maybe that's because, as I said, you know, there are geographical differences in, um, you know, how uh, communities, local communities are responding to this stuff. Um, you know, before COVID, I was splitting my time between New York and San Francisco. Now I've been in San Francisco full time. And in those two cities, there's been a lot of attention. There's been coverage in the, in the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle. As I said, there have been, there have been, there's been at least one major rally, um, a very large rally in Oakland um, out following the killing of, um, of Mr. Ratana Bhakti. And, um, in Go back to you know a lot of the communities that are affected um, by this the Asian bias attacks uh, connected to each other, right? And uh, um, you know, just to to be totally blunt, like I'm not sure if a recent Thai immigrant in San Francisco, like Mr. Ratanapakdi, is killed if you know my own family members um, who you know, our Chinese Americans in the suburbs identify with that. Um, and so I think part of that has to do with our own communities, right? Um, and, you know, and I think part of it is that there is an element of kind of um, erasure of Asian Americans um, in looking at, and because of the prevalence of the model minority myth um, in our country, I think there is a sense that, um, you know, Asian Americans, um, aren't as, you know, there's a perception that Asian Americans aren't as vocal um, when uh, things like this happen. And, you know, part of that is true, part of it isn't true. Um, and yet that that could be, there could be something going on where it's kind of um, the lack, the perception that Asian Americans aren't going to do anything about it or aren't gonna say anything about it could be, you know, perpetuating um, the, the level of attacks. But again, I'm just speculating. I'm, you know, not, it's not my area of expertise. What do you think, Caitlin? I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a connectivity issue. So I'm not sure if, um, Maya, I'm not sure if you were able to hear. No, it actually might be my Wi Fi. Um, were you asking kind of what our thoughts on that gender disparity or that kind of like gender presentation? Either piece of it, either the, the lack of, you know, public outcry. Um, generally, um, that the questioner is, is perceiving um, or on the gender disparity issue? The um, public outcry is, it's really fascinating. So my, I run an organization called the Queer Asian Social Club that's centered on like these ideas of representation because, you know, Asians in general don't have a lot of visibility when it comes to Western media despite the fact that our, our mother countries have enormous industries for media um, production. Um, and so kind of, we look at through the lens, like how important, and we're always considering like the presence of representation. Uh, and I think the fact that even in this past year, like I found it frustrating that in the past year when our country is kind of coming more and more to terms with racial injustice and actually confronting it head on, there are still sometimes gaps in our fight for anti-racism. And it sometimes, you know, I've kind of felt the tension where there can sometimes be this oppression hierarchy and that attributes to some of the ways in which the media is presenting different stories about marginalized groups. Um, and I don't know, I, I think it, for me, it's almost felt like it falls into the, the perceptions of the model minority, like, oh, Asian Americans will be fine. Or the perpetual foreigner of, oh, Asian Americans are, you know, like not even, you know, like they're not American. So like, why should we be kind of talking about them? And it also kind of remind, I'm trying to pull this up right now, but um, it, it reminded me of this really great quote from Stephen Yun, uh, who, currently is the star of Minari, um, what a really fantastic film um, about a Korean American story, uh, immigration story. But Stephen um, recently in the New York Times Magazine uh, said, sometimes I wonder if the Asian American experience is what it's like when you're thinking about everyone else, uh, 
but nobody else is thinking about you. And that like really struck me in, like it kind of, I feel that like to my core and I've been sitting with that since I read this quote. Um, but it also feels really reminiscent of the way that the media, this media coverage and this public outrage is almost in comparison, which it, it feels really irresponsible to compare harms. Um, and also kind of like comparing coverage of these harms, it's almost like this, they're just Asian, you know, like they're just Asian. And, and that's kind of my read on that, frustrated, so to, very much so. Yeah, I think one thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, I'll, I'll just say, I'm not sure what um, the person who had the question had in mind, but if, to the extent they were thinking about like contrasting the public outcry about police brutality and police killings of black men or black people versus what's happening now. Couple, couple thoughts about that, um, just to name it <laughs> outright. Um, one is that, you know, there, there's, these are, these are acts of private individuals, right? Um, and so I think that one thing that needs to happen um, is that there's a part of the analysis of what is happening right now that connects what um, the rise in anti-Asian attacks to the actions of government, right? And so, um, you know, I, as I've talked about um, anti-Asian violence, it's private violence. Um, I've tried to connect it to Trump's comments about um, COVID as the Chinese flu or as Kung flu. Um, and to talk about the ways in which how government agencies and government leaders respond to you know, an increase, a noticeable increase in anti-Asian bias attacks um, is really important. So you know, it, the fact that it is the police as an arm of the state um, that it, that, that's killing black men makes that a categorically different problem from these anti-Asian attacks. However, um, you know, there is at the heart of it, there's similar racist activity, racist actions um, by government. And in our case, talking about anti-Asian violence, um, it's about the ways in which um, government actors have participated um, or led the scapegoating of Asians in the COVID pandemic. I think that's an interesting um, pivot point to kind of ask you about your work with um, both the ACLU and the Center for Democracy. Um, it can be said that you know any hate crime makes society less democratic or undemocratic, or to put it put it another way, um, there's no ideal democratic um, society if there exists hate crimes within it. How often in your work do you deal with hate crimes, and how are these recent events um, with the Asian American community connected to the spectrum of hate crimes? Yeah, I, I haven't had to deal with hate. I have not had to deal with hate crimes, luckily, <laughs> in my actual work. Um, I know that there was <laughs> a lot of the ACLU, like um, other civil rights and civil liberties organizations, um, you know, engaged in a lot of debate over um, hate speech uh, and is it a thing, <laughs> to put it in technical terms, um, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s. You know, speaking just for myself, um, you know, I, 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 as a former public defender, um, you know, I'm generally not inclined to look for carceral solutions uh, to social problems. Um, and so, you know, speaking again for myself and not for my organization, um, you know, calling for increased penalties um, based on, you know, motivations um, when people commit violent crimes is, is not something I'm inclined to do. Um, and um, I am inclined to look for community-based um, ways of tackling the problem of anti-Asian bias. Um, you know, I, you know, very intentionally talked about the ways in which local organizations have done organizing and solidarity, um, engage in solidarity efforts in order to deal with the issues on a local level. I think that's really critical. Um, and it's, you know, it's just quite frankly fraught. Um, when early if the person who um, did the attack 
is another person of color, um, you know, to have a community outcry for criminal penalties on that person is something that I think is really um, you know, dangerous and misses, doesn't get at the real problem that we're dealing with, which is, you know, everything we've been saying about the erasure of Asian Americans, about, you know, the roots and the persistence of the model minority myth. Um, these are things that need to be worked out um, through hard work. And we have work to do in our own communities and our own families um, to address the barriers to working in solidarity um, for everyone's civil rights. Um, but but those are my views on, on, on hate crimes, broadly speaking. I just wanted to quickly uh, interrupt with the CLE password for those who are seeking CLE credit. Um, the CLE password is going to be anti-violence. Um, Cecilia, kind of off of that note, um, you know, in the work that we have to do within our own communities in order to kind of like understand or even what we're looking for in terms of responses to um, this type of violence and this type of crime. Um, something that has also been really interesting is how different aspects of the, the broader Asian community seem to get erased within this monolithic understanding of Asian. Um, and, you know, speaking for myself, uh, being South Asian, I, my family and I kind of know exactly what it felt like right after 9-11 to be brown, to be perceived as quote unquote a terrorist. Um, and, you know, there have been other instances like you were mentioning um, with Korematsu and the Japanese internment camps, which, you know, one of our justices likes to say has been overturned in the court of history as if that has weight, but that is just my anecdote over there. Um, and, you know, there are also like big immigrant communities that are here because they are refugees. Um, and yet that also, that experience is somewhat erased. And, and you spoke a little bit to it, how, you know, some folks are going to be experiencing mental health crises due to fleeing that violence and are still, you know, perhaps that isn't treated with nuance. And I wonder, how as a community, um, both within the Asian community and kind of like outside of our communities, do we recognize this nuance? Um, because this nuance between the violence that uh, is being targeted towards East Asian folks and those who pass as East Asian in response to COVID, um, how it's being targeted at um, brown Asians, so to speak, from Southwest Asia and South Asia uh, in Islamophobic contexts, um, and how, you know, uh, you see sex workers in Flushing um, who are kind of integrated, whether by choice or, or not, in various assumptions of sex trafficking and human trafficking, et cetera, as well as the refugee communities. And so those are like a whole bunch of different identities and experiences that make up the Asian American identity. And when we're kind of looking towards solidarity and when we're looking towards like community based um, responses and empowerment for a community, how do we hold all of that? Like how, how have you kind of <laughs> approached that kind of <laughs> nuance of our, our very huge community? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as a civil rights lawyer, it's it's not hard to hold that nuance. I mean, we do it all the time. I, you know, I've spent most of the last, you know, 16 years working on behalf of Latinx immigrant communities as it happens. Um, and I think it's, it's harder for folks who don't do this for a living, right, to, um, you know, hold the nuance, as you said, Maya, but also to actually do something, you know, put, put something on the line yourself on behalf of people that um, you not, may, may not feel particularly connected to. And I think, um, you know, there's a model for this in, in Asian American communities and Japanese American communities, Japanese American um, organizations and activists were among the most vocal and stalwart um, you know, opponents of the President Trump's uh, Muslim ban, right? And I think that, you know, the silver, one of the silver linings of the Trump administration is that um, 
there were so many opportunities for people to be in solidarity with each other. And so many, because he was kind of an equal opportunity <laughs> targeter of, of communities of color, um, you know, it, it was easier for, for um, you know, different immigrant uh, populations, different immigrant communities to see our common cause in fighting against um, what the US government was doing. And so I, I was really inspired to see what um, Japanese Americans were doing. There's an organization called Turu for Solidarity. Um, and uh, they were very much involved in, um, in organizing against Trump's uh, Muslim ban. So, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's always, in a way, it's, it's as easy to make common cause with African Americans, with Latino immigrants, as it is to make common cause within API communities, right? Like, you know, as you said, there, the experience of, um, you know, someone, a family that um, came as refugees um, and with, uh, you know, all the trauma and all the poverty that that entails um, because of that experience, that family has very little in common with, you know, a, um, you know, wealthy recent um, immigrant family from um, China or India. Um, and yet there, there, there's actually an opportunity in this moment for to realize that we actually have a lot in common and that we have um, a lot of work to do together. I always like to say that despite kind of all of the incredibly, you know, incredible differences, whether it be regional, um, our, you know, religions, our dialects, et cetera, there is one thing that always holds through, true throughout all of Asia, and, is, and that is taking our shoes off when we get inside the house. <laughs> For the importance of food. <laughs> yeah, and also the importance of food. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, I, uh, we also have gotten an incredible amount of questions, um, like really interesting questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, and one of them that is really, really interesting um, is from Vicki Portney. Um, and they say, while anti-Asian violence is obviously of great concern, there has been a significant rise in the expression of anti-Asian sentiments, including directly to Asian Americans, often yelled in public, but without acts of violence. Do you have a sense of how much this form of hate has increased in the last few years? To what extent have perpetrators claimed First Amendment rights in this regard? We should not lose sight of this form of hate. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know in terms of, you know, whether there's been a rise in, um, you know, uh, bias, you know, yelling, um, the epithets, that kind of thing. I, you know, certainly anyone who's Asian American has gone through that. And um, my sense is that there has been an increase in that, um, just as there's been an attack, uh, an increase in actual physical attacks on Asian Americans. Um, I just, I don't see how you can regulate that. Um, I mean, there are special, special contexts that, you know, where I think there are tools to regulate that, you know, public university campuses, um, you know, there are certain norms, places where you can have certain norms of conduct um, that are enforceable in different ways. But, you know, just being out in public, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's an enormously complicated, um, Thing to think about how we, if, you know, I, I would certainly to a crime um, to, you know, for anyone to yell anything. At the same time, you know, I recognize the extreme kinds of harm that flow from that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's obviously, there are many criminal offenses that are kind of at, at that line. Um, but, you know, it's, as someone who grew up frequently um, being, you know, racist names, um, frequently, you know, being yelled at by random people driving by, um, go back to China, go back to Japan, whatever it is, you know, I recognize that the harm um, 
of course, from those kinds of incidents. And, you know, fr from the receiving end, how unsafe I feel in those moments. Um, and the fact that something can tip over from yelling to violence so easily, and you just don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and I think part of the challenge, you know, going back to something I said earlier, um, you know, if your parents are immigrants and they grew up in an old country that's, you know, homogeneous, it's, you kind of have to make your own way as a kid, you know, as an American kid, trying to figure out how to deal with those situations and people of different ways of dealing with them. I just remember trying out so many different responses um, to being called, you know, a nip or a gook. Um, I have so many responses when someone says, you speak English so well, how did you learn? Um, you know, so many responses to where are you from? No, where are you really from? No, no, I mean, where are you from? You know, there are all those kinds of um, ways. There's such a, a range um, of ways in which we as Asian Americans are made to feel like we're perpetual foreigners um, in, in our own communities. Um, and so I appreciate the question um, because I also have the instinct that I want to do something about that. <laughs> um, but I think that the solutions to that are really about community response um, rather than a regulatory government um, response. Along the same lines, uh, Margo who has asked, as Asian and Asian American communities fight to bring greater visibility to this recent violence and keep our community safe, what models and legal solutions can we look to, especially while avoiding carceral solutions and police violence that relies on both anti-Blackness and can target our own immigrant or mentally ill or low-income communities? Yeah, I mean, I, I would throw that question back to you all because, you know, we're having a conversation here with the Penn Law School community. Um, you all are, you know, well, maybe you're not all in Philadelphia right now, but, um, <laughs> but, but you are kind of in spirit. Um, and, you know, those questions are so, like I said, I've been saying, you know, for the last hour, um, really local. I, I think the solutions are local. I think solutions are about community censure. They're about resetting norms of community behavior. Um, those are the effective ways to deal with it. I actually think that, you know, carceral solutions, like may maybe they work to some extent if you've got like a random person who, you know, realizes like I might spend, you know, um, a few days in jail uh, if I do this, um, maybe that'll deter them from doing it. But I just don't think the kinds of that the solution that ditch behavior and make us safer. Um, our communities it makes it unpalatable. Part of it is educating people, which is the opposite of what Donald Trump did, right? Um, and part of it is, um, you know, that there are, there are a range of ways that communities can deter this kind of behavior, um, that especially the smaller the community. So again, I'll throw it back to you all to, to talk about that. I also, I, I just wanted to mention really quickly, one of our um, classmates, and uh, they're also a member of APALSA, Raymond Magsaisai, uh, has recently written an article all about kind of like Asian Americans and the carceral system um, and incarceration, incarcerated Asian Americans in specific. Um, and I'm dropping a link to their article um, in the chat right now. Um, it will be formally published in uh, April, I believe it is. Raymond, please correct me if I am saying this incorrectly. Um, but I, I think it's it's another really great opportunity for folks who want to continue thinking about um, the carceral system, incarceration, and how it ties to different um, ethnic uh, and racial minorities. 
Congrats, Raymond. And sounds like you should be on this panel. <laughs> um, Caitlin, do you want to tackle? So oh, I think we have time for a few more questions that came in through the Q&A. Yes, I think so. And I think that um, related to what we're discussing about um, sort of local solutions and, and sort of the power of collectivization within the smaller communities in which we exist, um, something that a few members of our webinar today have brought up um, are ways in which Asian American oppression have been silenced within curriculum in schools and the role that that might play in how these um, this sentiment is, is allowed to perpetuate, um, as well as concepts of um, masculinity and femininity um, and sort of strength and weakness as it relates to Asians and Asian Americans and the role that might play in the public response to and the um, kind of original perpetration of um, violence against Asians in, in the broadest sense. Um, I guess one of these questions is from Denise Armstrong who asks, why do you think that even in the instances of extremely important historical events in Supreme Court cases, that have shaped the course of civil rights in the US, so little of this history has been shared as a part of the curricula in public schools and in general until more recently. Um, you know, I, there are a lot of different reasons for that. I think one is that because we're such a small minority kind of on the national scale, um, you know, it's, there's been little demand for it um, coming from our the affected communities, right? And um, I hope things are better. I think, I hope that curricula um, in K through 12 schools um, and, you know, core curricula at, at universities is better than when I was growing up or going to school. Um, maybe it's not. And I think, you know, I think about the ways, again, that um, African Americans are maybe um, knocking down the door for us to follow through um, because there's so much about the history of racism um, in our country that hasn't been told, it, that isn't regularly told when it should be. And so, for example, um, you know, one of my colleagues at the ACLU, Jeff Robinson, um, you know, has been giving a talk um, called Who We Are, and it's about the legacy of slavery um, and Jim Crow throughout U.S. Um, institutions and the ways in which um, you know, police agencies in the U.S. are kind of historically bound up with the enforcement of um, of, of slavery and of, of of race codes, and you know, some and so Asian Americans are not unique in that, right? In that um, your classic, you know, junior year in high school U.S. history course is not addressing um, important parts of our history that would help you know, all of us, all of us in this country understand where we are um, and, and how we got here and how we're gonna get out of, of some of the, um, how we're gonna solve some of these problems. So, you know, again, I think it's, it's I didn't learn um, about Japanese American internment until I was in college. And I learned about it because I sought out Asian American studies courses, and this is at Berkeley, right? Um, and so, you know, how we, we, we have new tools these days, right? We have tools that didn't exist when I was in college for spreading information, for correcting misinformation. Um, you know, those tools also come with, you know, lots of problems as we all know. But I think the more that, um, you know, we can um, correct the record and, express ourselves, whether it's through a law review article or through, you know, um, TikTok videos. Um, I think, you know, there are ways we can think about trying to increase the, the common knowledge out there in our country. Relatedly, um, we have a question in the chat that, that sort of brings up the point that um, if the historical experience of perpetrators getting off scot-free, um, if that and how does it encourage violence? And I think that's related to the conversation we were having earlier about um, the response, like state-sponsored interventions against um, 
discrimination and, and violence against Asian communities. And that's not to advocate for um, carceral solutions, um, but to say that there are, or to, to make the connection that there is um, this underlying like interlocking framework between the various structures of power that exist um, within our society that are upheld by um, a variety of, uh, I guess, conversations and, and points of learning um, that all sort of seem to come into play in how this manifests um, and how we take note of it as we sort of move through life. And I think that that's, those are some important points that have been brought up. I know that we're starting to wrap up, uh, even though I just definitely want to just keep talking to you about all of this for a really long time. Yeah. I also grew up in Northern California, but up in Redding, so three hours north of you. Um, so I, I'm super familiar with, uh, well, I don't know, I've kind of like been having this difference of experience of I know what it's like to be Asian American in California, but what is it like to be Asian American in Philadelphia? And like, there are, as you were talking about local community based um, initiatives to bring in solidarity to combat um, anti Asian sentiment. Um, I think a lot about those regional differences and how in Philadelphia, the Asian American community, I mean, I, I see so many more South Asian people walking around in Philadelphia than I did um, back uh, in uh, Northern California, which perhaps might be where I grew up, which was a very tiny, tiny, tiny town, um, known most notably for Megan Rapino. Um, but, you know, it, that I think is really interesting because you also, it's like a West Coast versus East Coast versus um, kind of middle of the country communities. All of our communities in these different regions have adapted in different ways. Um, and so in speaking to folks in Seattle, it's going to take a different tactic than speaking to folks in New York. Um, and, you know, out in Chicago, I know there's a big Hmong uh, population, which of course you can't speak about Southeast Asia without, you know, considering refugees and refugee populations. Um, and so I, you know, how in, how in your work have you been kind of confronting this or is this kind of a matter of having conversations like this with as many people as we can? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't confronted this really in my work um, as a lawyer, as an advocate. I have been confronting it just as an individual and um, just to spill some tea about the ACLU, um, you know, we've, we've had a conversation at the ACLU where Asian American staff, um, you know, were feeling kind of erased. Um, you know, there was a lot of internal discussion um, and acknowledgement um, when there have been, um, when there's been violence against African Americans. And um, the perception by a lot of um, Asian American staff, particularly and interestingly, Asian American staff in our California affiliates was that there's been silence um, when it comes to this um, anti-Asian racism. When in fact, we had put out um, not just internal, um, uh, not an internal statement, but external statements um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic last spring. Um, we put out a couple of videos um, about this and I wrote a blog post about it um, for the ACLU blog. But, um, you know, I, ju I just think just one person or a, a very small number of people can make a huge difference um, when it comes to how people in our community um, are feeling. And when, you know, when we're dealing with random violence, it's so easy for the entire community and for all the individuals that make up that community to feel unsafe. Um, to feel that um, they don't want to leave the house because they may be attacked. Um, and so when we talk about whether there's an outcry or not, it actually is about more than public perception or about having the political um, conditions for, for government action. It is literally about whether people feel safe to leave their house or not. 
because if a spate of um, bias attacks is in the public eye and there is a public outcry, um, then people feel like they're not alone. And so I think that, you know, having um, this forum, for example, for, to talk about it um, is really important. And that's something we're going through at the ACLU as well. Um, you know, how are we gonna make spaces for, um, you know, Asian American staff um, and other staff for everybody to come to come together and discuss some of these issues. Um, some of them are really hard. Some of them are complicated. Um, we, you know, there's there are always there's always the risk of kind of ha you know having oppression Olympics um, or people perceiving that there is an oppression Olympics um, going on. And so, um, but you know, this is just necessary when we're going to have frank conversations about something in that affects our community. Um, and when I say community, I don't mean Asian Americans. I mean you know, whatever local community we're talking about. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's kind of everyone's responsibility um, wherever we live uh, to try to about, about that. So if you perceive a lack of outcry, um, then there's something you can do about it by making an outcry. Thank you. I think that we're, we're really winding down on our time here. Um, and like Maya, I wish we could continue this conversation for much longer. Um, I wanted to jump quickly to say that um, our third CLE passcode is equity for anybody who is um, looking to obtain CLE credit. Um, and to just really extend a very, very gracious thank you um, to you for, for joining us tonight for this conversation. We really enjoyed Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And thank you. I'm, I've, I've learned uh, a great deal and, and really appreciate this conversation. Uh, Cecilia uh, Wong, um, thank you. And uh, as you said, this is an important discussion to be having, I think, and it's one that, that we uh, want to and will continue here. Sometimes it takes having a distinguished visitor of your um, stature and, and uh, willingness to spend time with us to, to bring us together and then we'll kind of build from here. So we I know I speak for all of us that we appreciate your joining and spending, you know, uh, an hour and a half with us. Um, really important topic. And I, I think the audience, as you saw in the chat, there, there were lots of uh, opportunities, both uh, at the law school and elsewhere here to, to continue it, um, including our, our student led conference this weekend. So Cecilia, thank you so much. And thank you to the uh, Maya and Caitlin and, and uh, Jennifer for your leadership and, and on this issue and, and many others. And, and also to my colleagues uh, in, in equity and inclusion and, and our kind of events and IT folks who, who brought this fairly large Zoom event together on, in less than a week. So, so thank you.